Hey health junkies, Dr. Krause here. Just wanted to jump in and let you know about a new feature that I'm adding to the podcast. It's the ability to ask me questions. I've had a ton of folks tell me that they would love for me to cover their questions on the podcast, so I'm going to do it. So each week I will be adding a couple of questions that I'm going to answer to each of the podcasts. And if it's a juicy enough question, I just may dedicate a whole podcast to it. So if you're interested in asking a question, head on over to my website at drjkrausnd.com. Check out a blue button on the right-hand side that says Ask a Podcast Question. Hit me up there. Or you can also access the button through my podcast notes also on my website. So head on over there, ask me some questions. I look forward to answering them soon. All right, let's get on with the podcast. Hey, health junkies. It's time for The Health Fix. Join your host doctor, Janine Kraus, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hello, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Kraus, and today we are talking about my most favorite subject in the whole world, pain. And the reason I want to talk about pain is I've been getting some questions from some listeners about pain and if I could speak a little bit about acupuncture and how it works and if I can speak a little bit about electroacupuncture. So this is the use of a little bit of electricity to help amplify acupuncture. And I said, heck yeah, I love to talk about this stuff. So you guys get to benefit from me talking all about my approach to pain and what I think all of us should be doing to help prevent pain. It's no secret that pretty much everyone is going to have some sort of pain. In particular, we have studies that say eight out of 10 Americans are going to have a pain condition at some time in their life. And and that's true. I kind of find that most people have some type of mini injury or something in that case. And in particular, Looking at the studies and the reports coming from the United States Bone and Joint Initiative, we're seeing that about 126 million Americans, so that's like one in two people, are affected by a a musculoskeletal condition. So this is muscles and bones, ligaments, tendons, things of that nature. And, And I would believe that that's true because pretty much I would say probably one in two people that come into my office are going to have some sort of pain. Maybe that's not the primary thing we're talking about working on in that moment, but pretty much everyone I ask if they're, they have pain, for the most part, I would say, yeah, one in two people are going to give me that answer. So that's big just in, in and of itself. I can tell you that these, these research studies and reports are true um, to, to what the average is. So another big thing, and and because my podcast is all about preventing us from getting old and decrepit, the a big thing is arthritis. And I'll hear a lot of patients say, oh, I have pain because it's arthritis. And maybe they had an x-ray that said, yes, they had some arthritis developing. But here's the thing. Arthritis is, yes, it's a wear and tear type of condition, but it does not have to rule your life. And it actually doesn't have to really cause you pain. More of the pain is coming from why do we have the arthritis? What's that stress on that joint? And that's where I like to work with people to get the stress off the certain joints. So that being said, if we look at what's happening with the American population, we have like 51.8 million. So that's like half of U.S. adults over 65 that have arthritis and are having disabilities because of that. That's that sucks. I don't want to be in that category when I get older. And and I've got some time to go before I get to 65. But heck, if you are in your late 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s, and you're, you're doing okay, you're moving okay, you want to maintain that. Because you can have arthritis, but you can still be mobile. It's all about getting your joints to be mobile and taking the pressure off those, those joints. So we'll talk about that in a minute. I kind of want to go through some more kind of points just to to hammer it in really that how much of pain is an issue here in the United States. And I'm sure the data is the same uh, worldwide. I just, of course, pulled the American data since that's where I live. And I wanted to kind of put that out there. So really, a lot of us 
can think, you know, if you're sitting there right now, whether you're driving, listening to this, whether you're walking, listening to this, whatever you might be doing, I want you to do a little check-in and, and think to yourself, when was the last time you had neck or back pain? I mean, a lot of people coming into my office, it's a, it's an everyday thing that feels tight. And they're like, oh, I'm just getting older. Oh, it's just from work. Oh, it's this, it's, oh, it's that. And we, and we kind of push it off. I mean, that's 75.7 million adults, one in three, who's just floating around with back and neck pain. And some studies are even showing that out of those 75.7 million adults that have chronic neck and back pain, 30% of those folks are having trouble sleeping because of that. So I want you to take a minute there and think about, have you ever had trouble because your neck was aching and your back was aching and, and you couldn't get to sleep? Or you fell asleep, but then you got your neck cranked and then you couldn't sleep. Or you woke up in the morning and your neck was in a weird place, apparently overnight, and now you got pain. It's, it's common. It's very, very common. And I, and I think that a lot of us brush it off, but this is significant stuff. Because if you think about your grandma or your grandpa or anybody older that has had a little bit harder of a life and they haven't taken care of themselves. What happens? They're hunched over. They've got canes. You all, everybody out there knows what I'm talking about. The folks that, that are, are just kind of getting by and they're moving real slow. I don't want to be that person. Heck no. So something to think about there. Now, how much do you think the average individual pays for treatment of bone or muscle or a tendon injury? I'm taking a sip of my tea while you think about that. Well, I was kind of shocked in the same report that I've been referring to this whole time, and I will put a link to it at the end of my podcast on my website. This, this research also showed that the average person pays $7,800 for a musculoskeletal condition each year. I could do a heck of a lot with $7,800. I could have a lot of fun. That's a great vacation somewhere in a luxury hotel. I don't know what kind of vacations you guys like to take, but boy, that would be a great deal right there. Now, take that in comparison to seeing an alternative medication, an alternative medication, I'm not an alternative medication person. Sometimes I feel like that if I'm giving too many herbs, but no, alternative practitioner. Acupuncture on average is about $900 to $1,200 for a series. And this is if you don't have acupuncture coverage with your insurance. It could be a heck of a lot less. Now combine that with some education from a qualified practitioner and you can cut that $7,800 down significantly. Go to like a quarter of that cost. So just something to think about in terms of just brushing it off because a lot of people that I find that brush off their, their conditions, they just let it go, let it go, let it go until it gets to the point where they spasm and then now they can't go to work so they're missing money out on work because they're taking sick days and maybe eating into when they could be having fun vacationing and 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 paying for their prescription medication or paying for all kinds of emergency treatment at that moment. Whereas if you had some maintenance going on, you could be doing pretty good. So just something to keep in mind that if you had maintenance treatment or even if you had alternative treatment like acupuncture, it's a lot cheaper than going the conventional route of just brushing off that you you hurt and waiting until things get real bad. Just preventative here. So 54% of Americans who have low back pain spend most of their days sitting. Well, that makes sense because all of us are pretty much front side dominant. By that I mean our psoas muscle, this is a muscle that attaches from your 12th rib and then attaches on the front side of your hip down in your groin area. This sucker is tight all day, every day while you're sitting. And the more you sit, the more you sit in weird positions, the more you drive, all of this is affected. And, and so sitting, of course, is the new smoking. We've you know heard that over and over again. But now it's going, okay, if we have to sit because we're working on computers or we're standing even, standing desks too, we thought were a better option. But the problem now is, is now we're in that fixed position. The idea here is, is to get the mobility going and moving, but also get the ergonomics right from sitting and standing. So if you have not had an ergonomic assessment of your desk and your workstation, get it. Get your doctor to write you a prescription for that if you need that for your office, but it's absolutely critical to have that. It's also important to look at what's happening in your car because you spend a lot of time in your car. And it's also really important to, when you get off of work, 
work on moving around mobility in morning too. So we'll talk about that in a later podcast. I've, I've talked about it in some previous ones in terms of mobility exercises. My favorite one is hip circles. Femfusionfitness.com, Brian Grogan, awesome gal. She's a little bit more geared towards females, but she does have some guy stuff in there, so guys, don't be afraid of her. She's actually quite cool, and there's some really good stuff in there to work on that back. Alrighty, so nine out of every 10 people with back pain have no idea what, what caused it. You know, yes, a lot of us sit all day, and yes, that's probably it in posture. It's also that we have no idea how we move. A lot of us walk terribly. A lot of us wear shoes that are not proper for us. And really, your feet are your foundation. If your feet aren't happy, your feet don't move well, you have feet, toes that don't move, your feet are have calluses, this all plays out in terms of how your pain develops. Because a lot of us are walking terribly, which is a whole nother story. And, and that's something that I think we also need to, to look at. But because 9 out of 10 people have no idea where their back pain come, came from, a lot of docs struggle to figure out where to go with this. I typically am going to recommend looking at the muscles. The tighter the muscle in certain areas, the weaker the, the anta- So you've got a, this relationship between a muscle on the front side of the body and the muscle on the back side of the body. I'm going to make it simple here. So there's something called an agonist and an antagonist. So for example, most of us know where our biceps are. Well, our triceps are right behind it, and the biceps and triceps are, are an agonist-antagonist relationship. Because if you're flexing your bicep, you're stretching your tricep. If you're flexing your tricep, you are extending your, your biceps, you're stretching your bicep. And a lot of times we have an imbalance between the muscles on the front and the back side of our body. I would be willing to throw down some serious money in terms of balance on, on most folks who sit all day, their front side of their body were so front side dominant that nine times out of 10, we have weak glutes, we have weak back muscles. And in particular, you know, we might have tight traps and shoulders and we're like, oh, those muscles are so, so strong. Well, they could be strong or they could just be really freaking tight. And so one of the big things I want folks to think about here is that we need to be working on the balance of our muscles. We need to have an evaluation to, to see how we move, but also what muscles are weak. You can get this through physical trainers. So athletic trainers, a lot of folks will have functional movement assessment degrees. It's a certificate. And and so I highly encourage you to look at that and see if any trainers in your gym have this. Also physical therapists. My preference is to have a physical therapist do this. But hey, if you're in an area and you can't find one um, that's close to you, look and see if an athletic trainer has this because it's huge, huge stuff there to, to look at in terms of balancing the body out. Because nine times out of 10, I'm going to see that front half of the body pulling someone forward. The pecs, the chest muscles, those guys, that's why our shoulders are rotated forward. And we have back pain because, well, if our shoulders are rotated forward because our pecs are pulling us, well, of course our back muscles are traps. So the ones on the back top of your shoulders, those guys are going to try to pull you back to try to create balance. Because our body loves to try to create balance, but in its mission to create balance, it creates pain. And that's where a lot of our pain is. It's literally the imbalance between a strong front side and a weak back side of us. And and I highly encourage you to dive more into that. Today, I'm not going to go through it. I think I need to do a video if I'm going to do more of that for you, because I don't think that words can really get the point across in terms of that type of, of thing. But for all intents and purposes, I wanted to mention it because I think it's absolutely important to thinking about pain. Now, we all know that we have an opioid problem in the U.S. This is a huge, huge problem. I mean, this is, this is addiction to heroin. This is oxycodone, hydrocodone, codeine, morphine, fentanyl. I mean, these are, these are big, big issues that we have. And interestingly enough, we're all kind of going that, looking at this and going, okay, this is a huge problem. What do we do about it because people have pain? Well, guess what? Acupuncture directly stimulates opioid receptors. And so does electroacupuncture. And so drug-free way to treat pain. I wish more people were talking about it because there's a lot of great research starting to come out on working with addiction and, and coming off of addiction to heroin, oxycodone, hydrocodone, et cetera, et cetera, using acupuncture and electroacupuncture. And so if you know anyone that has issues in that department, and, and here's the thing, the face of heroin and, and pain, prescription pain reliever addictions is changing. 
I just heard something on the news the other day, and I apologize, I don't know the source that the research came from, but it caught my ear because it, it, we're looking in the middle class, upper class females department in terms of heroin and opioid addiction issues now. And it's because we get start, these folks get started on taking a medication that the doctor prescribed for their pain. And then when that prescription runs out, now the doctor won't re-prescribe it. And this patient needs that hit to those opioid receptors. Acupuncture, electroacupuncture, huge, huge, huge stuff. So if you have anybody you know who's struggling with that, send them to an acupuncturist or electroacupuncturist who has been trained in opioid addiction recovery. And there, there's a resource that I'll put at the end of my podcast and drjkrausnd.com as a resource. Check it out. It's huge. So realistically, one of the things that I think that a lot of us don't even think about is that one out of every three of us on average in, in America have used a prescription painkiller. And that data came out in 2019. 19, 2015, 2015, um, which is a huge, huge problem. That's 2015. We're, you know, we're only two years out from that here at the time of this podcast. And, and that's, that's not good. I know we're starting to lower that amount of prescribing there, but that's the problem. And nearly 92 million of us adults, more, more or less 38% of us took a legitimately prescribed opioid like Oxycontin or Percocet in 2015. So this survey here, and and this survey was done by the government. It's the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and it it was released in 2017 this summer. It's kind of disturbing because essentially we're talking about the use of of these prescription medications, but that same survey found that 11 and a half million people, more like 5% of our population, misused the opioid prescriptions They've, they've obtained and they got them through illicit means, meaning that these folks were essentially using hand-me-downs from family or friends or bought it on the, the black market. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. And, and at, this, at the 2015 study here, it was reported that 1.9 million Americans, that's about a, almost 1% of us, reported full-fledged opioid addiction. So all that being said, I'm not going to bore you with any more data. I'm I'm a little bit of a data geek, but holy cow, we've got a lot of people that have an opioid addiction and uh, need some help. And acupuncture can help with the stimulation of those opioid receptors. And it's not just acupuncture, it's electroacupuncture. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit here too. So in practice, like I mentioned about one of every two people that come in are talking about pain. Most of my patients have tried opioid painkillers. They've been referred to me because their doc or their nurse practitioner were like, okay, we're not prescribing you any more meds. We got to help you here. Let's try to get you off this. Now, most of my folks have also been through physical therapy and it might have helped. It might, it might not have. I do still believe that physical therapy is important. I think it's what's being done in the physical therapy realm because It needs to be more invasive and and really having these folks not just run through the basic exercises. It needs to be more tailored. But that's a different soapbox um, because, yes, physical therapy is is absolutely useful. But I find that a lot of folks are are not having the attention that they need. And, yes, I'm, I'm guessing that insurance payments and this and that are involved in that. But we really do need to be paying attention more to the unique sources of people's pain. And that's what I like to do in my office. So, all right, let's get into my office. What the heck do I do? One of my main things is, of course, just basic acupuncture. And, of course, that's the insertion of needles into the body. And I will insert needles into muscles when I'm looking at pain. I'm also going to insert needles right into tendons and I actually have put needles right into the periosteum periosteum that's the outside of the bone to stimulate healing now that might sound crazy and painful but honestly it's it's not because if you get it done right and you're not hammering the needles into someone you're gonna get a great release of endorphins so something like enkephalins and dynorphins and things called beta endorphins and the other part is the opioid opioid peptides so these are opioid proteins. Your body can do this yourself and help with pain relief. 
The other cool part about acupuncture is that once you put in those needles, you're also going to get a release of 5-HTP, which is a precursor to serotonin, so you can feel happy, but also dopamine and oxytocin. Dopamine, of course, we know as our pleasure um, neurochemical, and then oxytocin, that is often released in, in the response for moms to have milk let down, but at the same time, it's a very relaxing neurochemical. And this is that acupuncture high when people talk about that. You get your needles in and then you walk out feeling on cloud nine, kind of a little stoned like. And, and that's, that's what acupuncture can do for you. It has that amazing ability. And, and it also has the amazing ability to work on relaxing smooth muscles as well. And that's why I love it for folks who have chronic constipation. I also really, really love using it for the immune boosting component because a lot of times when we have, say, a sprain or a strain, acupuncture is not going to fix that tear per se, but what it's going to do is bring a whole bunch of blood flow to that tendon, ligament, or muscle and get the body's attention there. I like to think of acupuncture as calling the body's attention to a certain area, basically like knocking on the door and going, hey, we have pain here and we need to fix it. We have something going on here. Let's fix it. So let's sit back for a second and kind of go through the whole process of what's happening to the body when, when an acupuncture needle is inserted. So I want everyone to look at their hand for a second while you're driving, be careful. But between your thumb and index finger, there's a point. And literally, if you take your thumb and index finger and you put it together, kind of close it together, you're, you're going to have a crease between there and you're going to have like a puff up of a muscle. This point here, it's called large intestine four, but this point is one of the most amazing points for helping with neck pain, headaches, all kinds of things. And it's, it's one of the points that I like to use for demo because if you go from just that point and you go down a little bit where there's the joining of where your metacarpal, so this is the bone for your index finger comes down and it meets the bone for your thumb, kind of like where you wiggle your thumb and you feel your thumb joint moving towards the base of it. There's a connection there just behind and, and, and it's kind of where those two bones join. That point there is the number one point for back pain in the acupuncture universe. And so You've got two amazing points right there, right next to each other. Super awesome. Now, now imagine just you're pressing that area or you can press that area. And what's happening is you're getting a signal. Even just by pressing it, you're getting a signal coming up your arm, going up, going up to your opposite side of the brain. So if you touch your left hand, it's going to go to the right side of your brain. If you touch your right hand, your message is going to go to the left side of your brain. And when you're touching that area, your nerves, so you have these nerves that respond to pressure. And these nerves that respond to pressure are going to literally bring blood flow to that area. And this is how massage works. This is how acupressure works. We're going to stimulate the opening of blood vessels and the blood vessels are going to run over to that area. We might get the release of histamine. So that area that we're pressing on might you know, also get some substances in there such as glutamate. So that's calming. We might also get a little bit more in terms of redness in that area. And redness is somewhat from the blood flow increasing to that area, but it also could be some of the histamine coming to that area too. I have a lot of people who you lightly touch their skin and that area gets red right away. And that's more histamine um, in that case, but, but it's quite cool. So Go back to your hand for a moment and you're pressing that area. So imagine now that you take your finger away and you actually put a needle there. What's now going to happen is you're going to trigger a different type of nerve fiber. It's called a nociceptor. And these nociceptors are going to sense that needle go in and that message is going to go back up your arm and it's going to go to the opposite side of the brain. And at that same time, we're going to get opening of the blood vessels, just like with pressure, but we're also going to stimulate certain types of blood cells to come to that area. So white blood cells, we're also going to get some red blood cells there. We're also going to initiate a healing process because the needle put into our skin is considered an injury because the body's like, whoa, I'm not supposed to have a needle stuck in me. That's something stuck in me. And so we bring blood and it just goes there. Now imagine that in that area, maybe you sprained your thumb. Let's imagine that. 
And so what a sprain is, is it's either going to be a small tear of a tendon or a ligament. And, and let's go with, let's say it's, it's our tendon, one of our tendons that we use for our thumb to give the thumbs up. Now, if we sprain that and then we stick a needle there, what we're doing is getting the body to bring more blood flow to that particular tendon, which is quite cool because let's face it, our tendons and ligaments don't get a lot of blood flow to them naturally. And so acupuncture is one way to get that there. But now also imagine that because you sprained that area, you've got some serious pain going on. Well, putting a needle there is also going to help to release natural endorphins to get rid of that pain, to bring it down. So it's, it's quite cool that we can use those types of, of procedures to, one, stimulate healing, but also to get the pain to go down. Three, we're also working on the release of serotonin. Now we can manipulate the types of endorphins that are released and we can manipulate if we get serotonin or dopamine to be released too. And the way we do that is with electroacupuncture. Because needles, you put the needles in and, and you're going to get the release of endorphins and you're going to get some serotonin, but you don't necessarily know how much and you don't necessarily know, it's, it's kind of like it's uncontrolled. Whereas with electroacupuncture, an electroacupuncture literally is the clipping of these little alligator clips to the needles so that you can drive an electrical impulse into the muscle or the skin. And it's quite cool because it also is going to, based on the type of frequency, so whether you go from 2 hertz up to 100 hertz, those frequencies can elicit different responses in the body. And I absolutely love this because if we're going on, say, 20 to 30 hertz, and this is millihertz, if we're using that particular width of, of hertz, we can get serotonin to be released and help with depression. Because a lot of folks who have pain are also depressed. And that's a big thing to, to keep in mind. And that's why some antidepressants are supposed to help with pain and vice versa. Because pain a lot of times starts as a physical response to, to some injury or some imbalance. But it sometimes develops into an emotional component. And we hold on to our emotions and then they turn into pain. And it's kind of like vice versa. They bounce back and forth. Or if we've had an injury, we hold emotional responses such as pain or betrayal or whatnot, whatever it may be, in particular areas such as the hips and shoulders. The hips and shoulders are biggies. Same thing with the neck. Um, it's, it's holding the weight of the world on you. So someone did you wrong. You're... you're doing so much you don't have time for yourself, things of that nature. But it, it's, it's really important to think about that pain is not just pain. You just don't feel ache, whatever. There, there's also an emotional component to it. It's frustrating. It makes you mad. And then if you look further into it, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different directions you can go on this. And so I think it's absolutely important to think about that connection there. Now, Electroacupuncture, like I said, has a bunch of different sequences to it in terms of how you can set it up. And it's, it's amazing. I, I will often do one point on the thumb area and then another point on where the nerve comes out. So say you sprained your thumb, that's going to go with radial nerve. So that's going to be in your neck at C5, so your cervical vertebrae 5. And so you'll put one point on the neck and one point on the thumb and you go from there. It's amazing. To, to see the results from that because electroacupuncture is essentially amplifying the results you can get with acupuncture. It means you can get more endorphins. It means you can get more of an emotional response and more, ser more serotonin, more dopamine, which is awesome. It's kind of like acupuncture on steroids. Now, some of you might be thinking about, well, I have a TENS unit. Is a TENS unit like that? And so a TENS unit is a little electrical device that has pads that you could stick onto your muscles. And absolutely, it's very similar. Acupuncture... It, the electroacupuncture is is just a little deeper than the TENS unit can go because we can drive that electricity deeper because of the needles, whereas the TENS unit is more superficial pads. And so a TENS unit is often what I will have folks who I am working with with chronic pain to put on their body to help with releasing more endorphins, but also helping to stimulate healing of that area because that is the most important thing about electroacupuncture and intense units. They stimulate healing because they're getting the body to remember that there's an issue. 
Because unfortunately, our bodies have way too many things to deal with on a day in, day out basis. They forget about where areas of pain are or where areas of injury are. And it ends up becoming chronic. The other big problem is that most of us do not take care of our posture and our weak muscles and our movement. We do not move properly. We don't mobilize. That is a big issue. And I want to talk about that next. Okay. So mobility and and finding out your imbalances is absolutely critical to getting rid of pain for good. And the reason I talk about this is because I've used acupuncture for pain for almost 10, more than 10 years now in terms of my private practice. And I've used electroacupuncture, but sometimes those two alone are not going to do it. Yes, we need the release of endorphins. Yes, we need to stimulate the body to heal itself because it's busy dealing with so many things. It needs reminders, but we can give it all the reminders and all the healing like precursors that it, that are possible. But if we don't change the root problem, the acupuncture and the e-stim, which is the short term for electroacupuncture, e-stim is the name, it, nothing's going to happen. So I really am, am working on a full scope type of a fix for people because it's not just getting a stand-up desk or getting you know a, a mobile up and down kind of desk. You need to really know about your posture. You need to be aware of your movements. You need to know how you move. You need to know those weak muscles because your weak muscles are the ones that are the problem. They're usually going to be the ones that oftentimes will spasm because they're trying to balance you out. And, and that's not good. That's a big deal. Off my soapbox on that. Because I've mentioned so much about us being front side dominant, I want to give you a little bit of a, a common case that I see in my office. I've got a lot of people who come into my office and they have back pain. And a lot of times it'll jump between being back pain and like top of the shoulder and base of the skull neck pain. Well, these things are connected. So why are they connected? Well, our shoulders, most of us have shoulders that are rolled forward. I even admit that I'm still working on myself and my posture because when I was growing up, I got boobs faster than a lot of my classmates and I, I tried to hide them. And so I would wear really big baggy shirts and I would hunch forward quite a bit so you couldn't see them. Well, that did nothing good for my back and neck. And while you're hunched forward with your shoulders, guess what happens? You collapse in the back as well. So now you're setting yourself up for issues between balance between your hip flexor in the front and your piriformis and your glute muscles in the back. Most of us have really weak glute muscles. We also have really weak piriformises too. And those guys will spasm on us and we'll often get pain on the side of our sacrum. So low back kind of butt cracky kind of pain or middle of the butt pain or top of the hip in the back kind of pain. Those are your sacroiliac joints. These can be a serious issue because I have a lot of people that come in and they're like, I have back pain. And then I go in there and I'm like, no, your back muscles are super weak. Yeah, they're spasmed. But then I come around to the front. So I'm touching them on the top of their hips. And I want you guys to, if you can, touch the top of your hips, like where you would put your hands on your hips to, you know, tell someone off. And then slide your fingers forward and see if you have any pain on the inside of that wing bone, that hip bone. And keep pushing, give it, give it a good amount of pressure and see if you get anything that feels uncomfortable. If you do, chances are, if you have back pain, your back pain's coming from the front side of you too. And what it is, is that imbalance. Now, that iliopsoas is the name of that muscle. It comes from T12, goes down to your hip bone, that wing bone, and it attaches into your groin. That one's mostly tight because you're, you're stuck in a flex position sitting or driving a lot throughout the day or poor posture where you're rounding your back and your shoulders are rolled forward. Now, someone who's done this for a while is often going to have pain on the top of their shoulder and the base of the skull in addition to that low back kind of pain. Because when we round forward, we take everything with it and the back side of the body is trying to pull you back into a good position, and as it tries to do that, it spasms. 
your levator scapulae muscle. So this is a muscle at the top of the scapula and inserts up to pretty much C5 in, in your neck. This guy can lock up a lot of stuff. And if you have pain in your low back, oftentimes you'll, you'll have a really tight levator as well. So the point here is that the body's connected Usually pain in one area comes from pain in somewhere else or tightness in somewhere else. Now, that's one scenario. A lot of folks that I see have chronic knee pain or chronic hip pain. A lot of that has to do with something called the IT band, but a lot of it also has to do with motion in the feet and the calves. And it's hugely important to make sure that all your muscles are moving, that there's no trigger points in those muscles. You want all of that to flow nicely. With electrostyle acupuncture, one of the best ways to go about this and work with it is, is to work directly with the nerves because your nerves are what are causing your muscles to be tight. There is a message coming from your brain going down to your muscle saying, protect, tighten. And that's what happens when one side is weaker than the other. But it also happens when we are injured. So say there is a knee that's got issue because it's been tracking wrong because let's face it, most of us have tightness on the outside of the knee that pulls the knee causing pain on the inside of the knee. That's a biggie. Or if we don't have pain on the inside of the knee, we have pain on the outside of the knee where that, that bone is called the fibula, the head of the fibula, because that's the attachment point of your IT band, that big band on the side of your leg that goes from your hip down to your knee. Those are biggies. And, and this kind of stuff is where electroacupuncture can be hugely important because not only does electroacupuncture deliver dinorphins and, and enkephalins and beta endorphins, so these are all your pain relievers that your body can produce, it also works with contracting and relaxing muscles so that we interfere with the signal back up to the brain. So like I mentioned before, there's a message that comes down to the brain that tells the muscle to tighten, but there's a message that comes up to the brain that's telling the, the body, we need to, to fix this area. We need to do something. We need to protect. So why does this happen? Well, usually, like I mentioned before, this is an imbalance and, and often the imbalance leads to pain because we, we have some sort of motion that throws us off. Here's a common one, and this I'm going to go back to the, the back. A lot of folks will be moving boxes, and, and that's why pain always tends to come with moving. You're moving boxes, you're twisting, you're picking stuff up, lifting, twisting. And that lifting, twisting motion causes the imbalance between the front side, your iliopsoas, and your back side, the glute area, to, to be thrown off. And what happens is that weak back side of you spasms to protect. So for example, the message to the brain is, okay, front side of me is super tight. So the body knows that. Your body has nerves that tell it where it is in space and pain and temperature and all that different stuff. But what it also tells is motion of joints because our joints have receptors, not directly inside of them, around them. And what happens is, for example, if we're constantly bending over, picking up a box, putting it on a shelf or picking something up and, and carrying it somewhere, well, if the front side of us is super weak and then we heave ho a box up on the shelf, the weak side spasms. Then we get pain most of the time, either in a joint that's been pulled out of place because of that muscle spasm, or we have a small strain. So we have a ligament or tendon that's been pulled and kind of frayed a little bit. And that causes the pain as well. Most commonly, I will have folks moving, moving injuries, put your hands on your hips, slide your fingers back, and you're going to feel a knobby bone. If that hurts, that's your SI joint. That is your sacroiliac joint. So sacrum and ilium, your big wing bone. That joint slides a lot in, in folks with pain because, unfortunately, front side of us too tight, back side of us is weak. And then we get spasms further down. So if you creep your finger down your sacrum on the side and then move your thumb over towards your hip bone on the side of your body, you might find some ouchy spots. And these kind of things are, are the areas in which we can work with acupuncture, we can work with electrostim, we can work with pressure. We can use lacrosse balls, we can use foam rollers, we can use gua sha, so the scraping technique, cupping as well to help to reduce the pain in these areas. And we can also use e-stim, so electroacupuncture, 
otherwise known as electrostim, e-stim in, in my lingo, you attach a needle to the nerve root. So say it's, let's go with L4, L5. Say the pain is coming from there and you have piriformis pain. So this is the muscle that attaches to your sacrum and goes to your hip bone. And that one spasmed on you. So it's like kind of the middle of your glute might hurt. Well, oftentimes I will take that needle, put it in L4, and then I'll take another needle and put it into right where it hurts that knot in the piriformis. And I will start those two to contract, will um, kind of increase the hurts. And we'll work on that and get that area to calm and we'll get the endorphins moving. Then I will take the needle and move the needle from L4 region, so that's your, your spine, lumbar vertebrae four. Then I'm gonna move it to the origin and, and insertion regions and a little bit off of that because I don't want it right on the tendon, I want it actually in the muscle. And then I'll work to contract that muscle belly of the piriformis. Because if we can contract it, we can send a different message to the brain. Because contracting the muscle to, to the brain is going, oh, okay, that, that muscle's moving. All right, I, I'm getting a different message. I'm not getting the message coming back from pain, protect, pain, protect. Instead, the message is, huh, there's some weird contracting going on. And what that does is send a message back down from the brain to relax the muscle. So electroacupuncture changes the message going to the brain, and that change of message going to the brain brings a message back down to calm the nervous system. So calm the tightness to that particular muscle. And so one of the really cool things that can happen here is that electroacupuncture can block pain transmission signals up to the brain. And it can also block them on the way down. And so the body stops to feel pain and is not feeling it anymore. We don't get that reflex of tightness. So that's pretty cool. I really love to be able to do that. And, and it's a great way to not have to be taking opioid pain relievers. But like I said before, it's not just electroacupuncture. Electroacupuncture can help for a while. It's You need the posture. You need to fix the root problem because electroacupuncture um, in a lot of cases is going to just help with the pain relief and keep you off the meds. But I like to keep folks thinking is we got to get rid of the root cause because I can electroacupuncture the daylights out of you. But if we don't fix your feet, we don't fix how your posture is, your walk, et cetera, and your muscle weaknesses, you're going to be back in my office in, in like six months or so. So that's the most important thing to keep in mind. And I am working actively right now on a full protocol for this that I will have in a course online on my website at drjkrausnd.com. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be coming out soon. And that's going to be a comprehensive program to help you to get on top of your pain and see if we can get you pain free and not using all of those nasty medications out there. Now, another big thing that I often will work with with folks is we sometimes need multivitamins because unfortunately, as much as I'd like to say that we get all our nutrients from, from food, we don't right now. It, our, our soil is just not that rich. And so I do recommend multivitamins because we need multivitamins to help us, those B vitamins and whatnot, to help us to get the proper nervous system transmissions with electrostim, but also with acupuncture. We need proteins. So we need to be digesting our food properly. We need proteins in our diet to be able to create these opioid peptides because they're proteins. So something to keep in mind too. Absolutely huge there. My other recommendations are that I do think that most folks with chronic pain and, and those folks who are extremely active with sports need a fish oil on board for keeping things lubricated in the blood vessels, but also reducing inflammation in the body overall. Inflammatone is a product by Designs for Health that I absolutely love to reduce inflammation in the body. Theramin is another one. It has curcumin in it. And Curcumavail is another product by Designs for Health. Theramin is by a company called Natural Factors. I do not get any kickback from any of these companies, just so you know. I just really like them. That's what, that's what I use. And in terms of fish oil, Nordic Naturals is my favorite brand or Stronger, Faster, Healthier. They have some great products too. I have links to that on my website in my notes 
um, and in particular in the resources section for this podcast. Now, I also am a huge recommender of something called Dr. Bob's Medicated Oil. It is a Asian mix of, of oils. It's got cinnamon, it has peppermint, it has licorice, it has something called dragon's blood, it is a plant, and it also has skullcap in there. And I find it absolutely useful for amplifying pain relieving results because it's enough of uh, you can get it in there with heat and 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 just drive it into it's enough good things mixed up in there to help to also calm the nervous system down and send a different message up to the brain and and it just really helps with bringing blood flow and continuing to bring blood flow, flow to those injured areas now in terms of using herbal pain relief along with a tens unit or an acu stim um, treatment it, it's it's something that is huge. Like I, like I said before, you need a comprehensive plan um, because a lot of us will be like, wait, if you're putting needles into an area to stimulate healing, aren't you creating inflammation? Yes, I absolutely am. The electrostome acupuncture allows for things to flush in and out. So I bring proteins in and I take proteins out and I bring them in and I take them out. And so it's kind of like a radiator flush to the, the painful area. And it's useful extremely useful but the the important thing to think about here is that while i'm creating inflammation i'm also trying to change the signal to the brain about this pain because we need to keep in mind that our our brains are are absolutely responding to all of the different stimuli that are coming to it and in the case of of chronic pain we we need to inflame and de-inflame because a lot of folks are super sensitive to to the electrostim style acupuncture and they get great results but then sometimes later on in the day they might be achy for 24 48 hours and then and that might last like i said 24 to 48 hours after treatment and then the pain goes away after that and they have some really significant great pain relief. So what I'm saying here is the reason for the inflammatone, the reason for fish oil, theremin, curcum, avail, and, and the medicated oil is really to help folks get over the hump of the good stimulated inflammation to wipe out the bad inflammation. And, and the difference between good stimulated inflammation and bad inflammation is that this good stimulated inflammation is purposeful. It's reminding the body to heal that area. Whereas the bad inflammation is, is just all these inflammatory proteins that sit and stay stagnant in the areas of pain day in, day out, causing the brain to, to keep tightening and pulling and, and keep that message of pain, pain, pain going on and protect, protect, protect going on. So what I'm doing there by re allowing folks, or not allowing, <laughs> it's free world here, <laughs> by having folks on the herbal pain relief while I'm doing a series of e-stim, it's, it's helping to really clear out the non-productive inflammation because really electrostim acupuncture, TENS units, um, re-educating yourself on posture and things of that nature are going to provoke inflammation, but a new type of inflammation and a new message to the brain. And that's what we're going for here. Essentially, electroacupuncture, acupuncture, and and acupressure, massage, all of that, different types of body techniques are all going to retrain the brain and get it out of the cycle of pain, 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 pain. That's the whole point of all of this is changing your brain's function, interfering with your neurochemical system because your neurochemical system with chronic pain is stuck on that button of repeat of pain. And so essentially summing everything up in our podcast today, I am working on trying to help people re-educate their brain on how it views pain by working with mobility, by working with strengthening those weak muscles that you may have, and then also getting purposeful pain relief and purposeful messages going back to the brain so that your brain is not stuck on that ouchy pain, pain, pain loop. So consider electroacupuncture or acupuncture in general for helping you to get out of a chronic pain loop and Hey, I would love to hear from you guys. I'd love to hear questions more on acupuncture too. I, I love to talk about it and I hope that I've given you a little sense of another aspect of acupuncture today. 
So once again, you've survived another podcast. This one's a little bit of a longer one. I apologize. I hope that you all have a fabulous day, whatever you're doing. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in to The Health Fix, the podcast all about taking control of your health, rebelling against aging, and having fun every day. A lot of patients ask me, do you think I'm aging too fast? So I created an evaluation checklist for you to see for yourself. Plus, I created a resource guide to help you slow down the aging process right now. You can find it for free on my website, drjkrausnd.com. If you like this podcast, help get the word out to others by liking it and rating it. If you'd like more natural health tips and want to join our Facebook community where I interact daily, click on the Join Group button on our website at drjkrausnd.com.